Welcome to the second episode of the Must Make Podcast. This is Jack speaking. Hello. Uh, to those of you just tuning into this episode, hello, welcome. And uh, welcome back to anyone who checked out episode one with D-Bridge. If you didn't, you can go back and check it. It's, um, you know, you should be able to link off whichever platform you're listening to this on. Uh, quick thanks to anyone who listened to the first episode and sent me a message, um, all of that feedback and positivity and overall thoughts on the thing were uh, very greatly received thank you very much um yeah so let's get into this episode um for this one i've got lsb my uh, good friend i've known for many many years um for any of you who don't know luke lsb uh you should probably you know go listen to some mu- his music you are missing out um the good place to start is probably his blue hour album which he released at the tail end of last year with DRS it's um, pretty special I think um, yeah so he's taken a very different path with his musical career um, to a lot of different people he's very different in the way that he approaches his work to me um, and his the way his things have panned out for him have been very different so it was really nice to sort of take some time and shed some light on the, the difficulties, the successes the similarities and you know things he needs to work on um, and we talked for a long time and I've listened and re-listened and really thought about it and we've spoken about how we want to present this and it's now in this form so yeah, um, without further ado let's get into it cool, this is episode 2 welcoming Luke LSB to the podcast hello mate, you alright? Um, yeah, how are you? I'm very good, thank you, yes um returning to this ragtag setup that I had for the last podcast and remembering that it's a bit of a ball ache, but it's all good, yeah? Yeah, it works. It, it, does, it does work, yes. yes, fortunately, it does work. Um, yeah, so it's good to have you on, because obviously um, you are someone I talk to a lot as you know, group of people who, between us, we chat quite a bit, um, and we talked quite a bit, obviously, after I'd recorded the podcast with Darren, and you were quite helpful in helping me sort of edit and work out what was good and and bad about it and obviously I think that got you thinking about how you'd answer some of the questions maybe Um, yeah yeah I think so but I overthink it just in my normal way maybe yeah but yeah Um, so it's really good to have you on and obviously yeah the main the main points I I think you know because you listen to the podcast which is which is great it's like good to have you nicely prepped Um, but I think I'm going to kick off the discussion in in roughly the same way that I did with Darren, which is um, I'm going to caveat and sort of wrap up this question beforehand and explain it a little bit. Um, So the, the, the MO of this podcast really is to sort of get into creative processes and not get bogged down in the tools and all that sort of thing, but it's looking at the sort of creative struggle and how, um, you know, you get past writer's block issues, how like, your creativity interweaves with like your work or whatever like that um and also like creative patterns and things like that so my question to you would be if you had your creative idol in front of you what would you ask them and uh, what would you want to know from them i think i i, I would the, it comes back to one of one of the issues i have with um myself and the term being a creative or creativity is I almost have a inability to completely fully commit and let go and just let it immerse me and just let let that take me on the journey. And I always feel like I have to have an element of control. So I mean, as a kid, as a as a as a teenager, I suppose really like Tom York was probably my creative idol, um, and I feel like. It might be slightly technical what I'd ask him, but after do you think, they, do you think they, your question would has maybe changed? Like, do you think now you'd ask him a different question than maybe when you started? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, completely. I mean, I think because as I've got older and become aware of my uh, aware of my how I think and why I might do things, and and like coming from such, just a kid who just wanted to make some tunes to someone now who perhaps thinks a bit more in depth and as a potential career and something that I could build my livelihood off and 
also just questioning the the why like why why do i do this mm. um uh, um so yeah mate my, as, a, as a kid my question might have been like oh you know how did you how did you write this tune or how did you come up with those lyrics um but i think like someone like tom york interested me and um as as a teenager okay computer come out when i was about 15 and it was my life my absolute life that album just just listen to it at religiously just anywhere and every everywhere i'd have it on it drive my mum crazy because i just have it on in the room and, and I, I but just i absolutely love tom, like tom york and i was i was and he become a gateway into like pink floyd and the stuff that influenced him so I, I I spent a few years just really going backwards due to the, my love of Radiohead, who I, mm. I first my fir- I first saw in Cambridge like a couple of years before, and like one of my mum's friends introduced me to them. Wow! But at the time, I was fascinated by the fact that they'd made this album, and it would it kind of they played Glastonbury in '97, and they they'd kind of made it. They'd gone from it was Blur versus Oasis, and Radiohead with this outsider. And then suddenly they were the they were the big thing, and I, I'm not sure they were quite comfortable with that. And what then happened is it almost broke up the band, and it's quite well documented. But what happened then is for the next two and a half years they were they were touring, and there was no new music. There was just rumours of new music. But effectively, what Tom York had done is told the band, or so the story goes, right? We're 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 chucking out the guitars. We're there's, um, we're getting a load of synths. We're getting these. We're, we're getting new in, in, uh, instruments. We're going to start sampling. We're just going to change in the entirety of how we write. Hmm. The drum, drummer was using drum machines, so they almost they just cleared the decks and said, you know, we're learning. We're starting again. And I'd love to know whether that was what what the reason for that was. Was that just yeah. them like trying to make it harder for themselves deliberately? They felt that they needed to, or they needed to become. I don't know, less acceptable on a commercial level. They just and and what they created was Kid A, an album that came out probably three years over three years after OK Computer. And it, but the first time you heard it, you're like, Whoa, what the what the what the fuck is this? It's so far removed from yeah. anything that they've done before. I and mean, I was like, wow, this is like, what what are these sounds? And they're sounds now that are even like they're like distorted roads and and sounds that are actually not that revolutionary on them in themselves and drum machines and kind of samples of um like mouth like noises you'd make with your mouth but using them as a percussion that you kind of hear in dance music but it's not really been brought into that kind of prog prog rock um spectrum and yeah it just it it it, it totally fascinated me at the time and I, I suppose i'd just like to know like what was what was what was the driver behind that do you think but do you think like don't you think um i guess you didn't know this at the time because yeah i guess you were just well, how old were you at this point like when this happened so so kid a come out in 2000 so i'd just gone to uni i was, I was, eight, I was 18 yeah so you probably you probably weren't as mature with your creative thinking then but you probably like now surely you must like see other there's loads of well there's quite a few other acts who once they've done a sound they try and down those tools and then just like reinvent like i think we i think actually you talked about this a little bit before with darren in the previous episode it's like i think i think that's like almost a sign of like a proper creative is like they never want to tread the same ground again and it's like it would have been easy for them to just keep writing probably that same style of music over and over again but it, it almost i think they're looking i think people like that are looking for like new challenges by um they're just like right well what if we do away with all of that and what does this what does this new challenge bring and i think that speaks to what i th- like how i believe which is like being a sort of like resigning to the process of making but like if you just change the tools every time what what similarities like come out of it yeah i think i think you you get you you'll change you can change all the tools but for instance those two albums which are market marketably different at the time if you if you look at them at the benefit of hindsight they're both so obviously radiohead they're so obviously tom york and particularly johnny greenwood who was like the kind of musical maestro behind it and yeah i think like for them yeah i'd agree that um that so, there's something in their creative psyche wanted needed the change and and yeah i think the option was probably the band splits up because it they didn't have the drive to just do the same thing over and over again 
or they or they, or they just re, reinvent themselves. And I, th- I, th- I think that. See, in in, in right, I, th- I think one thing I just want to. I, I, I like found the first podcast really really interesting with Darren, and when I knew we was going to talk about uh, this, uh, us two, and I've known you for many years, Jack, and and you know that I, I don't know that. I can be quite self-deprecating sometimes about myself and I, and sometimes that's a defense mechanism. But one of the, one of the first things that I thought about is that I, I find a lot, I find it really uncomfortable to talk to talk of, about myself as a creative, as a creative person. Mm. Um, Why? I, like, I don't like the, I don't know the a self-awareness around the pretense that exists, mm. uh, a fear of kind of fully committing to it. Um, I don't know. Like I, I and I think, I, well, I I don't know. So, so I thought about it a lot in the last couple of weeks. So like, why why have I got this reluctance to commit to being creative or or to say I don't know when I meet someone in the in the pub or I don't go to the pub much. But if I meet someone new <laughs> to, to 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 say you know I'm a DJ or I, I like I almost feel myself curling up inside if someone says hi and this is Luke he's a DJ and I'm like, oh no, I don't. Yeah, there is there is a sort of uh, I think I think that is something I've learned with being a little bit older um is that there's some it's it's it is certainly seen as like a young man's thing so and i i think people look at me with gray hair and think what okay and also the the other the other aspect of it is um having to use the phrase drum and bass when you talk about what music you make and how that that makes my toes curl i don't mind i don't mind when people say what do you do and i'm like oh i'm a musician like i write music and i dj on the weekends and stuff and they're always like well what sort of music do you make and i'm like well it's sort of underground <laughs> yeah. you'd have to kind of call it drum and bass but i just don't like that term really because it's just i'm totally the same i'd be like oh it's this soulful side you know like you're almost saying i feel bad because maybe i just i feel that by say, even by saying that, I'm being really dismissive to a whole culture. But that, I, I think that that's a separate issue to the fact that, like, even even like, I think my, my wife helps ground me in that sense. Sense to like, I, 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 I'm I'm nervous of being pre- pretentious. And when I was thinking about us chatting, I was like, right, I'm going to try and drop that nerves, and I might come across really pretentious for the next uh, hour or so. And, and it's not, um, and, and and I was just going to try and try and. Li- drop my self awareness and just actually mm. say how perhaps mm. I really feel about these things. I think I think it goes hand in hand though, mate, with um with being with um making stuff and putting it into the world, you inevitably have to talk about it. And then I think you, that's maybe your hang up that you think it's pretentious because that means that maybe when you watch people or hear people talk about art or i don't know cooking on a cooking show and they're like, "Oh yeah, this like, you know, it's delectable blah blah blah" using all these adjectives. Maybe you're like, maybe there's something there that's like, oh, I just don't like it when people talk about that. It's a, it's almost like um, reducing it to its simple thing. But I find that really contradictory to like your music because well, the thing is, I think about a lot. If, if I'm in the studio and I'm in the comfort of my own company, or I do think about, and and we'll we'll hopefully go on to like that, not why I'm making it and how how it makes me feel and how I want other people to make it feel. But to describe that in an everyday, like you, you meet, I don't know, Jeff, who's a friend of a friend, and be like, oh yeah, I'm I'm a producer, and what I do is is I try and think about colours and feel, and I want to mm. express how I'm feeling and put that onto some music, and then they're like, what do you make? And I'm like, oh yeah, drum and bass. Yeah, yeah. I mean, lit- I think I think surely it depends on the context. So maybe this discussion is like the perfect place to sort of actually say what you're you know do you know what i mean because not everybody's going to understand it it's like it'd be like to, like people talking to me about sculpture like I, I can admire some sculpture but like if someone came up to me and started telling me i'm trying to do this that and the other with my sculpture i'd be like oh, i don't fucking get that to be totally honest yeah, yeah no. so I, i'm hoping that the audience that you you have here jack is something that will will kind of understand that but i suppose it just comes into that issue with being like describing myself as a creative i've become more comfortable with it and i think as well it's it's the balance in my life so i still i still work three days a week as you know and i think mm. a lot of people are surprised by that i i kind of had this upbringing um where you worked and although although my grandma was very expressive and would dance and like my mum loved her music and she she kind of escapes into books now and one of my mum's 
boyfriends when I was about eight, my brother's dad, absolutely loved music, completely obsessed with it, would take us to like dub reggae festivals and he played bass and like he, I suppose he kind of nurtured my love of music. Um, but it was never something because growing up in like a real kind of working class council estate or something to, to, to think that it was realistic to be a creative and to make mm. it a career like my granddad who I, I lived quite, I lived with my grandparents a bit on and off, you know, they're, they're all tradesmen and I was never that. I was always a bit of an outlier, but so I think to, to describe, if I had described myself as a creative in those kind of circles as a teenager, as a kid, it would have been like, Oh, that's great. Well, but come on, you're going to come on site with me and lay some bricks. And I was, <laughs> I, I didn't, so yeah. So, so I just think that what then happened is, is I was relatively academic. I did okay at school and it was even quite weird for my family that I went to university. I was the first out of like 20 odd cousins that went to university, just took myself to university. It was kind of an alien concept. So there wasn't an environment where it was ever feasible to me that you could be a be creative and have a job it was kind of like you just that was a creative job it was you worked and i was i had a kind of love for economics and maths and so teachers said you know you did like you i know you love music and stuff but you're gonna go and work in the city and so uh so so i think all that kind of festers into this uh, almost uncomfortableness of being a creative and now i'm I've got a family, I've still got a job and I, I almost like if I fully commit to being a creative and then I might, am I set myself up to fail at being a creative and then how does that feed back into my life? But I, it's something I've become more comfortable with and, and sometimes, sometimes I, I, I like say to my wife, I'll be like, oh yeah, you know, creative minds, this is, this is how I think and she'll be like, oh shut up Luke. Just to really pick on that point, but um, it's a semantic argument because it depends totally on your what you because I think you feel probably uncomfortable with it because your definition of it is fixed where I'd think it's pretty like fluid. Yeah, I, I know. But I, I suppose what I, my not the de- yeah as you say it might be a fixed definition. It's a really fair point, but I suppose it's that kind of taking it from something to be a creative person to being a, a, someone who tries to make it something that sustains their life i suppose like i don't know but you you're but you're probably to be honest you're probably doing better to maintain that division where it doesn't become the be all and end all because i think maintaining a healthy boundary between um your work being important to you and being creatively fulfilled and feeling like you're getting that expression and that um weight off through um doing it's almost like you're consciously trying to maintain a division between this being the be all and end all, but then still trying to achieve when you do make stuff a certain feeling and a certain thing. But just maybe, maybe you think about it in a different value set, just just to mitigate the harm it can have. Maybe I don't know. No, it's it's a really fair point. I mean, it's despite all of that, what I would, my one aim would be to sustain like my family and everything and a good good standard of life just making music and dj and whatever comes comes around it that is that's my ultimate goal mm. and i think that um like i've i've got a job that i enjoy and, and it provides balance and it supports what it pays my mortgage and it means that when i get in the studio which is quite rare at the moment i don't have to worry about what i make being something that can make money it's just, it's not it's not it's not even a consideration when i'm when I'm making music and that's very liberating. And, and I suppose I have a fear of losing that liberation. I have a fear that suddenly I have to make something in the studio that's going to make money. And how's that, how's that going to affect my mindset? Well, I know historically that I haven't been able to write. It's just, it's just like, a, it's just a void in my head. And the, I mean, the key thing I think I would ask you, um, which is, I guess it's, it's going back a little bit time wise, but it's like, because I remember, like, there was a period of time where you were, like, writing some music, and I remember you'd had a, a few individual releases out, but then I remember there was, like, a period of time, a transitional period, where you sort of went from releasing the odd record to, here's an EP, and it sounds accomplished, and this is my sound, and here's another track, and here's, this is my sound, and I'm just wondering, like, what... um what happened there i went through kind of like i don't know like changes in personal circumstances i kind of 
suffered from like and this is yeah like late 2000s now and i was really stressed because i wanted at this stage i just wanted it i wanted to be a dj i wanted to be a producer i've done like four years promoting and i was kind of not really anywhere with my jobs and um i just wanted it bad and then it kind of just manifested itself in kind of some awkward awkward, awkward ways in my psyches and like I had some issues. I like developed a bit of an issue with gambling in my like mid twenties, and it was kind of linked to this fact that I really wanted to be a producer, and I wanted I needed some money so I didn't have to work. So because the reason I couldn't be in my mind, the reason I couldn't be a producer because I didn't have enough time. I think like and a compulsion and addiction are something that uh, probably s- exist within a lot of producers because you need to you need to have like a dedication to put in the hours and to put in to put in the amount of time. Um, to, to achieve something and it just like i got to like i was about 28 29 and i was like fuck i need to i need to sort my life out and sort it out like like i haven't gambled now for like well so like well over a decade or anything. i sorted a lot of shit out of my life and it, it kind of ca- came ca- came back to this kind of like why 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 am i why do i want to be a producer why do i want to be a dj like i, like, I lost all perspective of everything so i had a bit of a shift i sorted out myself um like re- took the pressure off started working like pro- focused a bit more on my career um said look it, if it happens with music it happens but if it doesn't you've just got to enjoy the process you've got to enjoy making music so so i made a tune called all of my all of my love um and kind of finished rolling sideways to a degree and it felt more like me and i've sent it to sent it to steve uh bc he was like yeah that's really good like yeah i sign it i put that out so he and that kind of gave me a bit of that gave me a bit of kind of confidence and i spoke to lucy and and just said you know like i just want to i just I, I do want some time to make some music but i know i've got to have a balance in my life i need to I need to look after m- m- like my mental state i need to look after like supporting my family or you know just paint just just normal life and then somehow create a bit of time to to make some tunes so i really knuckled down i worked really really hard i managed to get myself in a position where i could go down to three days a week in my job um and i was like right two days a week and just focus purely on the creative process and i think what happened is is that it was probably about 2000 and well, in fact actually i know and, and this is going to get really deep and uh, uh so in so i'd had this tune out of spearhead i think i'd done a couple more for steve at this point and it was going all right i was enjoying it so in i think in 2013 i was playing playing football and just like pre-season friendly on a saturday and i was i don't know i was, looked up to the sky for some reason and I, some reason i covered my right eye and it's like hang on a minute i can't see out my left eye that's weird maybe my contact lens has like, slipped off or something and um and so got home and I, just, I remember it because we were moving house we, moved, we just just bought a house in Brentwood and we, we were living in kind of Newbury Park before that and we were due to move the next day so I played football and we had to pack up all our house and it comes to the end of the Sunday evening and um and I was, I was like loose I still can't see um and she, we were like okay we better speak to someone so like a, like a friend of a friend was a kind of nurse and she said yeah you just need to go down moorfields so i went down moorfields and they're like oh you detached your retina and i was like oh okay that sounds that sounds bad what do you do in there so like, come back in the morning we'll, we'll we'll check it out properly so drove up in the morning and then they're like okay this is like you detached it pretty bad but we should be able to operate this afternoon have you got any family history of eye ailments? And, and I kind of recall something from my childhood where my mum had got tested for for a, 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 a eye disease, but she was she was not defined as a carrier. Um, but it turns out she was. And I'd got this kind of um, this so this eye disease called uh, X-linked retinoschisis, um, and yeah, it's pretty bad. So it detached my retina was detached in the left eye and they were like look it's, it's probably not we're going to try and repair it but we we don't know what the outcome is and 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 by the way this is happening in your other eye as well and we got we, we could have to have some serious looks at this I was like, mm. so it was a bit of a it's a bit of a shock and so i went through a number of operations and the one thing that come out of it is that i just said to work i was like look i i'm 
I'm I'm le- I'm quitting. I just want to do some music. Like I don't know, don't know what's going to happen with my eye and with my life. And like I I can't wait any longer. And they were like, look, what 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 can we do? What can we do to? We don't want you to leave. Like what can we do? And I said, well, maybe look, if I work one week and take a week off, would that work for you? So that's what we did. So I went part time then, and it gave me this kind of balance where I still have today, where I was earning a wage and some creative freedom and like really that my creativity just exploded at that point felt completely liberated i've made a couple of notes just while you were talking because um what it seems to me like as quite an interesting uh, and an interesting trajectory that we can talk about and it can actually help inform the discussion about your process is that it seemed like everything was getting in your way of doing what you wanted to do until you became like really, really focused by this thing that was going to eventually or potentially stop you from doing what you really, really want to do. I guess it's like people that have life changing experiences or near death experiences. They suddenly, everything goes into focus and you're like, right, this is what I want to do. You've got to stop procrastinating on it. Yeah. No, no, I think that's totally fair. So like the, the kind of, yeah, I definitely not a natural at, at it. I've not, not had any training of mm. any sort and we we kind of and it's, it's probably to our benefit we we both started producing in this kind of weird age that was between hardware and it was the early kind of digital audio workstations mm. that were kind of these fully comprehensive suites and there was not much that had come before it in terms of tutorials people were all learning and there was dogs on acid and there was things that you could review and actually I've, i ended up finding a lot of those I spent a lot of time on forums learning and then what i realized was that there's just people on there that didn't know any more than i did but they were just quite happy to talk about it like yeah. they... i i got really really lucky with the timing of how things work for me um and i think that accounts for so much of um, well, that's a that's a life skill. I mean, yeah. like people people's whole people's whole life is quite often dictated by timing as much as anything. Mm. And and I think actually the other parallel that I've found just talking to you a bit more in depth. I don't know if we've ever even had this sort of chat before. I mean, when you and I have worked together, even it's been I've never been able to sort of peg. I can sort of peg that you're very much a you take your time and you really work and work and work and there's a lot of detail and a lot of. Um, a lot of making, then reflecting, and then making, and then reflecting. Yeah, well, so it, no, no, yeah, you you nailed it. Now, so I I made a track called Leave, um, which Marcus signed, and I'd just come friends with Marcus playing golf not long before that, and that was a track that I made in maybe two and a half hours, and that was really rare for me. Everything was quite a long process, and then I spent like months tweaking it to actually just go back to like the first version I'd sent and just release that. Mm. And that changed a few things in the sense that I always took a long time over the details, but it's still, that is still part of my process now. I was actually last night, I've, I've just set up a new computer in my studio and I'm just kind of working out where things are and uh, porting over hard drives. And like my, you've, you've kind of nailed part of my creative process in the sense that I, I quite often let things develop organically over a, a long period of time and i i know you're very quick because you send me a demo at 10 a.m and then you send me a completed track at 4 p.m um <laughs> whereas whereas i will i will i will start something and think right i, I love the feel of that i like the way it's make it like I, like I think there's something there and i will listen to it and listen to it and listen to it and think about what i need to do and i'll spend a lot of time thinking about what i need to do rather than doing it and it's probably actually quite a bad habit so 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 what so what gets you over the line with that then because i guess um um, just let me just flesh out that a tiny bit more because it's like you go back like i I think people that work in daws do that often where they have old projects that they love but they could never finish them for whatever reason and and maybe there's a part of acceptance where it's just like you just have to accept that at the time you did it you couldn't complete it and you can go back and in two years time you might have the uh, faculty to do it um but so what about the tracks that you finished and what about like can you pinpoint things that were maybe different about the tracks or about what you were doing or how what your headspace was like or whatever that helped get you over the line with those ones yeah so i think there's a few few elements of it one is kind of a 
bit of luck in the sense that you kind of find something that works and writes itself. And you, I, I do now, like since leave, I do sometimes get tunes that kind of write themselves. Mm. The core there, and it does happen with me. It's not, it's not something that it's like I'm consistent with. But I suppose the main incentive to finish a tune, that, that take it from one kind of nice demo to a finished tune, is is actually whether I think it's going to be good and be reflective of me and I actually think I can get there I can hear where it needs to go and I can get there um so take and but it's, and that there's no like predefined amount of time that that takes it can be a day it can be a, a, a couple of sessions or it can be can be genuinely years I've got I've got a tune that I think I started writing in 2012 which I know one day I'm going to finish and I think it will be one of my best tunes, but I'm just not ready. I'm not mentally ready. I'm not in the rights. Like I need to be, I need to, when I open the sequencer, be in the, in the space, um, in the headspace that I was when I first kind of got the idea together to then mm. carry it through. So to, would you say that like, um, confidence is quite a big factor? Yeah, I think it's if confidence is a factor in kind of all, Water life. Is it, okay, so would you say that's like a parallel though between? Is that a parallel universally for you, like for for anything? Like, are you, like when you play football, you're a confidence player. Yeah, relatively. Yeah, I definitely mm. am. And uh, if I, and I, 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 I tend to in my life playing football score a lot of braces because if I get one goal, I always fancy myself to get the second. <laughs> or the, so d- I d- so okay, let me. Exp- so there, there is there is that. No, there <laughs> so the tunes is, so the tunes come in twos for you then. Or do they come in bunches? Um, they come in. They definitely come in bunches. Mm. They come in flourishes. Now, I'd say that ninety percent of my studio time is posturing, kind of shadow boxing, kind of just like waiting for something to happen, preparing for that moment where okay, everything's right. So, what does that? Hang on. Let's instead of like. So, what does that preparation look like? Um, it's right from a basic level. It's um, it's sampling. I spend a lot of time. And that is that's. When I'm at my when I'm at my best and at my most efficient, when I got a gig abroad, take music onto my laptop, sample, sample on the way home, do that for a few rounds, then get in the studio with it, and then I kind of see if the samples work in what I've been working on before. A lot of listening, a lot of just just listening to my own music, be in the studio, be on the road, to just kind of hear the kind of nuance and the and the next kind of sound that I need. Now, what, I what, think, are, you, what are you listening for? Um, I don't know, like it's almost like sometimes being able to identify like the next melody, the next sound to hear. Can I, I, think, can I ask like, you a quick one then? So yeah, um, if if you're like you just said, you're listening for what the next chord or melody should be, mm. but but that that to me, it, and this is going to sound weird as well, but that almost is a technical. So so what what. If you're thinking about what the next chord should be, what should it do, and what what is the function, and what is the what what is it you're looking for? Is it a feeling? Is it like? Oh, it's um, always feeling. It's mm. always feeling. It's sort of definitely. Um, like I think I I don't think of myself as someone who's got like synesthesia. Or, is, is that the way how it's pronounced? Yeah, we see but, yeah, colours. Uh, we hear. Yeah. So, but I, when I when I like when I'm making tunes that I think most sound like me, uh, they all sound like a particular colour. Um, and I, I become a, like, I, there's, there's blues and there's greens, and I've occasionally made a couple of tunes that I identify as red or orange, but mainly it's blues and greens. And so I will, I be, like, I'll be, so when I'm listening to something that's maybe in its demo stage, I'll be, I, I suppose I'm just getting myself familiar with it. So then when I next go into the studio, kind of know what the next feeling is. Um, like I think, like so there's tunes. The tunes that I think are most me are, and you can you can easily group them. If you so, I think there's a tune called "About Tonight," a tune called "Sketch for My Sweetheart." There's a tune. There's the Parallels remix from Technomatic, and those three. And there's others that sit quite close to that. But the tunes that are kind of most express me as a producer are those, and they are they all three of them kind of portray a similar kind of color and a sphere when i was making it and they're all kind of cordy and they're all um i think identifiably me i think if someone understood my music and heard that for the first time they would have 
a reasonable stab that it was it was me that made it those those tunes took absolutely ages because i'm like looking for really real real like nuance and without getting too technical they've all got really um really kind of tight voiced chords and really really stacked so that means if you kind of played the notes out of the chords individually and built them up sometimes two of the notes would sound wrong if you played them just together mm. they would sound a bit dissonant but then if you build it up and they're both they're all inspired by like uh faulty who produces Jack drake's music who's mm. very big on these kind of close mm. voice chords i i think i just had a quick listen to them before we started talking um and i think they sound like the most accomplished in terms of um like you can i think with those tracks you can tell that you've made it and then gone away done some thinking done some listening had a thought about what it's going to look like next gone back done some more done some more done some more and that um i think that's a very different way than i work um so but but it doesn't make it any less like valid obviously i mean i'm not that would that would presuppose that my way is the valid way which is bullshit obviously um like so the way i think it comes back to the music i listened to as a kid so i was when i got into the beatles for instance which is like well part when i was about 14 15 listened to all their albums i then got into their anthologies which are kind of like demos and i was really kind of fascinated by the process that took that those demos to the tunes that existed like sometimes the demos were better even though they were just like an acoustic guitar and mm. sometimes they were different and that's influenced the the way i work in the sense that all three of those in fact many many of my tunes they sound like demos in the way that you would hear a band's demos tape in that they're kind of core chords are there to a point and they sound terrible they're produced terribly but and I don't even know how I got from there to the finished tune. I can't. I can't even tell you how it happened. But that is often the process I go through, which is a really mm. basic demo, which I get familiar with, and then I almost develop it into something that sounds a bit more accomplished. About tonight took ages, took eighteen months at least, and <sighs> it was, it was, it was a process of kind of. It started off that uh, that tune where I had the kind. There's like an ethereal kind of vocal sample, which is I can't even remember. It's like some trancey record or something, and I got like a melody with that. And then I had some sampled pads, which didn't quite work with the chords, but one of the chords really resonated with me, and I was like, right, that chord. I mean, it was only like I think like a B minor seventh or something, but just the way it was, it sounded. I was like, right, that's perfect. But none of these other chords in the sample work. And it was one of the first times I was like, right now, Luke, you just got you just got to write your own chords. You can't keep relying on samples. So I, st I then built up the progression myself, and it took a while. And then there's other counter melodies on top. And but so, I guess my question would be then with that is you've put all the hours in, you've you've uh, addressed and readdressed issues, you've thought it to the nth degree. At what point did you? Do, how how do you get down with the process of letting go then at what point at what point is it just like okay that's done um if because because you've gone through so many iterations and so many patterns of thinking with it how at what point is it like this is just done i really yeah it's something that i really struggle with and that's something that marcus was particularly good for me personally with because he was very good at that like Tyler's stripping away the crap and being like that's done that just needs this or something like that but yeah it's it's i think I, you learn with experience what's when it's done i don't i think i don't know if you was it in the podcast with darren you mentioned the kind of relationship with perfection or finishing yeah, in, or imperfection something like. yeah imperfection because i because i think i would i would say and this isn't a bad thing but i would say that i can't hear imperfection in those tracks like parallel and the parallel remix and and about tonight they sound very like you've almost ironed out all the kinks well parallels the snare <laughs> that to like it's a bit too clubby but it was and i also like i didn't so there's some minor things that are still here but i love playing those records and i still play their records it's, but something like sketch for my sweetheart i've got probably i like one day i feel like i might just release it maybe on like a soundcloud or something like the process of the, the multiple versions where you can hear it where it's developed where from and to because 
it's 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 quite a big insight to the process it, that started off with a kind of sampled strings and an arpeggio and then i started playing the arpeggio live on some i, I put it into midi on a synth and kind of automating it live and then i built a chord progression that was loosely based on these sample strings removed the sample and then i was like shit that's just the same progression as about tonight just like a tone up mm. so then i was like i can't do that so I needed to re so I needed to rewrite I needed to rewrite some chords around it. So then I kind of shifted to something else which was less kind of like four constant chords. And like I feel like I captured the feeling that I wanted in that tune. And this is where you kind of sound pretentious and you go back to that conversation in the pub. Like to me it sounds I don't know, it's like a bit otherworldly it, it kind of it, it, it kind of captures images for me of like places that i've never been that i'd like to go to and that's the that's what the chords are doing for me and i kind of i feel like i nailed it i feel like that's it and i, I have this weird psychology as a producer where most of the time i think i'm really really shit um and like really like kind of down but then i have these moments where i'm like right i've like for me that's the best sound and i've cracked it and i'm really actually i know i tell everyone i think i'm really shit but secretly in my studio i think i'm the best producer in the world whereas the, the answer is probably somewhere in the middle but there's moments there where i'm like right i that feels to me exactly how i want it to need, feel you need both components to be successful don't you because if you weren't confident you'd never finish anything um and if you didn't if you weren't self-doubting you'd never improve anything you know you've if you went in if you go in thinking everything you make is the bollocks you're never gonna um you know improve or write a good record i don't think probably yeah yeah um, i think it's, it's i think it's fair and i'm nothing if like in most aspects in my life i'm nothing if not a tryer i'm like and yeah goes back to my football i'm not particularly great but i try bloody hard and that and that's with, with music i just tried really hard put a lot of hours in there's a there's a lot there's a lot of work yeah exactly and i think that's the thing so whenever people whenever like people ask me like you know what do you need to do to be able to become a producer or whatever it's i i always just say it's just time and energy and yeah. I, I i think again where I, to go back to the what i said about me being quite lucky with the timings is that for me i just discovered music production software when i was like really really young and i just fell in love with it when i was like 15 so i did all the groundwork and all my proper learning before i was even you know 16 17 years old yeah so your brain was still a sponge and time was still kind of limitless at that yeah stage and I, in your I, life. like I, there's key points for me right um basically that and then mm. um and then going to university and learning about like my create my idea about creativity and all my sort of theories and thoughts about that inform this podcast came from one tutor that um tutored me through three years of doing graphic design at university it was more like a fine art degree but he basically made me think in a way that allowed everything that came afterwards musically to happen and I really have serious doubts about what would have what would have been had I not had that tutor um in terms of thinking about process because he was all about process and that's where my thinking about when I go to the studio, I, I'm, I I don't I rarely go in with like a set idea of what I want to do. I'll just be searching for a feeling or searching for a mood or something, and then I'll just resign myself to whatever happens happens. And sometimes you come out come out at the end of that day or that session with a really good idea, and sometimes you just needed to do that day to get something out your system. And but there's a but there's a but there's a pressure with that as well because sometimes like like we said at the beginning if you do a week where you're just self indulgent and you just allow yourself to sort of make some music and it might not necessarily be something in the real world you sometimes get to the end of the week and you're like fuck like I feel like I've just wasted that week and I've not you know what what have I got to show for it and you and you can't quantify the fact that actually you needed to do that session to allow yourself maybe next week or the week after to be able to have the successful session where all the good shit happens um so it is a bit it can be like, i find it a real roller coaster in terms of mood and also um output so I, I guess i would i would wonder how that how that looks for you like how i, I guess also this is the other thing mate because you because you work three days a week i guess that that free freedom that you've got when you do go in i'm really i'm firstly i'm really envious of that but what i would want to ask you i guess is how 
how what I've just explained as my experience of creativity, how that kind of works for you when you go in for your studio days and how um, you, your mindset works for that. Well, I think it's like it's, it's fairly interesting, and and when I was two days a week, and I did, I've I've had two, I've got two two kids, two young kids, and that's that's kind of the last couple of years I've had, I had to really change my working process again. I used to get really stressed out if I weren't making tunes, and I was shit. And I, I do, I have this mentality, which is, you're like you're only as good as your last tune, and maybe you're never right. I, like I do sometimes think that last gig in my calendar is the last gig I'll ever do. And the last tune I made might be the last tune I ever make. And yeah. it's, that's quite, that's quite a stressful way of thinking of it, but it's also you provide some, provide some balance. So it's I, also a motivator, I, isn't it? It's like your feet yeah. to the flames sort of thing. But I, I'm I, at the moment, I've just done a second album, which well, I've done a collaborative album with Dell. And at the moment I have nothing, I have nothing to offer the world in terms of music because I, squeezed out everything i could before my second uh, for ada come along and i've had to kind of rebuild a studio since and i'm at the moment i'm in this kind of preparing stroke procrastination phase where i'm getting myself ready for the for the next for the next kind of burst or, where, or the next kind of period of time and i'm like if, if if my life goes to plan i will i will stop work for a period of time and just throw myself in into music completely and and that is all I want to do at some stage in the next few years. And I'm hoping that that'll be quite creative. So uh, there, there's that there's, I've learned I've, over time to like control those. Um, I still get stressed that I'm not going to write another good tune again, but less stressed than I did maybe like five years yeah. ago where it felt like if I had a couple of bad studio weeks, I'd be gone. I still, I feel like it might come back. And like also to bring maybe like back to some of the initial points of discussion um and like particularly when i mentioned what i'd asked tom york is what uh creatively like the, well, after i finished my first album which i felt was a real um real good it kind of expressed how i was then as a producer and it, I, i'm really proud of it uh, there's 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 nothing particularly i'd change looking back like, technically i've probably improved and maybe the mixes are not what quite what they could be and there's other elements but I, what i set out to achieve i feel like i achieved and um but we what i never want i didn't just want to repeat it again with us with a second album i didn't just want to do the same thing um and so what i had with the blue hour is, is i kind of had a shield in dell and maybe we both had a shield for each other in the sense that we could both be a bit more expressive and creative because we had the support of each other and maybe support of like the, the fans that we we both developed and it, it gave it gave gave us an opportunity to um experiment a little bit and that it's been quite nice because it satisfied some some kind of creative urges um and now it's kind of given given me a almost like a full reset and now i feel like i have a bit more confidence to to go a bit di- to go a bit deeper into to what i want to achieve what is that um <laughs> probably well i think if if i think if i was just making tunes purely and i everyone says oh, i make tunes for myself and stuff but i think if i was being purely self-indulgent like my tunes would probably all sound too similar because i wouldn't if i was being i wouldn't perhaps experiment as much as i could and things would all sound a bit like sketch for my sweetheart where it's just and it is the amount of times i get get something going and i feel right okay that's just too much in that vein like maybe i need people need a break from that kind of sound but i have this kind of idea that i um i write drum and bass and the least interesting elements of my music are the drums and the bass and i find that quite like quite fascinating in itself that actually uh, the drums that i write are they're kind of like a center point of my tunes so and i i know some people would find my drum tracks boring and that's a really fair criticism like my drums don't have too many edits and they can kind of roll through the same loop that's a deliberate thing because i feel like an effective tune can't be too complex and that that is you can't have but i think that i would certainly say that about your tunes actually is that um they're 
effect, like very um they're very rich and complex in the palette but they've they're quite simplistic in the loop and they're quite satisfying in the way that they resolve i th- i remember when we were making that wrong to love you tune you had a real hang up about like i think it was the last bass bass note or something and the way it resolved and i can i can hear that in i actually wrote down a couple of other tunes as well hang on i wrote down that one that we were talking about um a while ago when I sent you that tune and you were like it needs atmosphere it's there but it needs atmosphere and then you sent me that blinding tune and, yeah, that, yeah. and, that, and that one's like the way like I think one of the strongest elements of your work is the usually arrangements and the resolving nature of how the whatever's happening musically um loops it's very it's very loopy but then evolving <laughs> um but like in, a, in a, i mean i'm you know I, I keep saying these things that sound like pejorative statements but they're actually like they they well, i think i i take it as a compliment because it's kind of deliberate it's why well, mm. it, it's on the face of it not a lot really happens but if you if you're willing to kind of let let yourself go into the nuances of like real subtle progression then they're really really interesting music that can kind of capture you so if you're looking for like drum edits and bass edits it's not really particularly what i excel at or or particularly what i want to do i try and provide a solid counterpart ca- uh, counterpoint within the drums uh f- particularly which where the rest of like, the kind of melodies and the um the pads particularly and the sounds can kind of weave weave around and you might find that within i don't know within like a minute of, of tune or a minute and 20 seconds of tune it's the same sounds but they've all kind of moved position in the mix and it, it and so your points of interest within within your ear and how you listen to the tune will have changed and you might hear ghost sounds you might hear things that you didn't hear before and i, I absolutely love that about music and i i find repetition fascinating i felt like I, I still don't i still think that some of the best sounds in music are when across the feet frequency uh, range one thing's moving against the other part being static and how i describe that is is you've got an, a kind of looped arpeggio which is something that I, I do a lot that is playing the same four notes or the same eight notes or whatever it might be that those eight eight notes will sound really really different if the bass bass is shifting around it and it creates a different mood and whereas i feel like if both both parts of that were moving at the same time you would never kind of you never be able to really understand the movements of the bow of, of them both uh, and I, f- I just find that really really interesting to listen to and and it's quite a deliberate thing uh, it also i'm probably not technically good enough to write like amazing drum tracks or anything but i think this is like all self-deprecating <laughs> but, but like so, but uh, it's it, it's like a, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a protection it, mate it's it's what people do yeah. to protect themselves it's 100 percent. it's one of those things where if you don't, if you set a lower expectation, it's like, yes, like, like, I, like for example, you like. I think what's been a really nice uh, development in our little peer group recently is that I think we're all talking a lot more and sharing a lot more and helping each other get over the line with creative struggles more so than we were since probably the AIM days or something like that. Um, yeah. So. And I feel like we're all more vulnerable with each other in terms of saying, oh, I'm really struggling with this or this is difficult or, you know, um, I, I, got, this is like, I, I, just a caveat, I want to make these conversations eventually more diverse and like not just two blokes chatting to each other. But I think with the whole masculine thing, the whole sort of male, um, not crisis, I'm not fucking Jordan Peterson, but like, you know, like the whole... The mental health aspect, I guess, of, of like male side of the species, I find this all quite helpful stuff in terms of um, defining, helping, and it's like confidence building. So there's, you know, all of us are quite self-deprecating at points about um, what we're doing. I sent you a tune last night, and I was like, you'll probably hate the vocal, but then you hate all the vocals <laughs> I put in tunes. No, yeah, I, that- I didn't hate. The- I listened to it this morning, and I didn't hate the vocal, so that was, that was quite a nice tune. But I need to give you. But I think that the the, the mental health aspect of uh, being creative or, or like our peer group is quite prevalent because I think that like to a certain extent to be able to commit the kind of time and emotional resource to make like from start to finish 
a drum and bass track consistently and just do it a lot requires some certain mental characteristics which can manifest manifest themselves in in negative ways mm-hmm. in other elements of your life i think you need to have i need to i think you need to be a little bit addicted to it you need to be a bit compulsive and you need to be able like to like the the amount of hours that at certain stages in this kind of creative career that i've dedicated to it are crazy there's been sacrifices on social yeah. lives there's been sacrifices on like family time uh like how do you how do, how do you manage that like how because i i find it very difficult um when i'm really engrossed in a project um when you're working like long long weeks and you know um you're not you're just no, nothing else has got your focus i find that has such a all ranging implications in all like my my actual health will deteriorate my i won't be eating properly my relationships will suffer um well i think i think like as i touched upon like my life got a bit out of control in like my mid to late 20s and so one of the things that come out of that is learning to kind of learning what i need as a as an individual to keep keep to keep balance and perspective so like i certain to to i have a lot at the moment to balance and studio has studio has taken a bit of a back seat and the first thing that i had to, is, is i had to be okay with that i had to learn to be okay with that in the past I, that might have stressed me out too much and i might have got a bit resentful of things that were preventing me getting in the studio so i've kind of learned that uh, it's just a life skill that okay you know your time will come and if 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 i really needed it you know i could quit my job i could i could make time for it but you know that sometimes you have to i don't know um graft a bit it's something else you really enjoy the moments you get to yourself in the studio and then also like i i ensure that we talk about the effects on your health and your physical health and um I'm, I'll, like exercise is something that's kind of saved me to an extent i i always played football i always played sport loads as a kid absolutely loved it um and then that kind of lost that i kind of lost that i still play, always played football but i just lost the general fitness and like i started to crave endorphins from elsewhere that you can achieve through exercise for instance and now even now i try and ensure exercise like five times a week if i go on tour try and ensure the hotel's got a gym and even if it's 15 or 20 minutes because that kind of thing really like one it it ensures you eat well because you you're hungry from it it ensures Mm. that you and then so so like you just it's just like an experience thing and i'm quite fortunate in the fact that quite a grounded like family life with kids mm. and wife and and I, so i have this kind of something 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 in which i can pin my the, the rest of my my day to it, it sounds to me like it's it's managing it's like and sometimes i can really do this and sometimes i can really really struggle with it but it's it sounds to me like it's it's almost managing the dynamics of um interplay between the creative stuff and the and the work and the and I think maybe that comes with like maturity. Uh, I I'm obviously I'm like full time uh, musician and I think it has it has its massive upsides and its huge downsides. Um, it's it means you can be it's quite an indulgent thing. You know you're just sort of I come to a studio every day and that's it. And it means maybe that I don't treasure or make the most of that time. Like I could almost do what I do in three days if i was really focused and had had three other days in the bank of solid actual earnings um so it's it means that you can sort of frit it away sometimes a bit well i think it's i I mean i my want is to be a full-time musician and it's kind of but i'm also a bit scared of it because if it happened like i think sometimes life is about a journey and it feels like maybe i'd be worried that a full-time musician is a bit of a destination can i ask a really like question that gets right to the heart of that going full-time musician do you think the reason i can't say aside from the finances because it can't be aside from that it's always got to be a factor but do you think that it means that you'd to go back to the beginning of this conversation about you defining yourself as creative or whatever do you think that if you went full-time it would mean you'd have to like fully wrestle with all of these definitions the hang-ups and the sort of 
yeah it's, it's kind of do you know what i mean it's like is is i understand that like part of it is just managing it's day to day and you need the you need the solidity and the rigidity no sorry what's the word the the constant of a job but then there's also the fact that you might have to wrestle with some of these more sort of abstract ideas about feeling like a creative or feeling like an imposter or you know yeah uh, yeah and wrestling with them on a day-to-day basis i think that's a factor and i think that the yeah the fear of almost completing a journey and then getting there and then suddenly just finding myself in the studio and not being able to write a note <laughs> is like it's, it's, it's definitely a fear it's a genuine fear and it's, it's something that I, I keep i keep almost pushing back I keep pushing back when I'm going to do it. I was going to do it this year, and it might not be this year, it'd be next year. I just want to fully commit, even if it's like a six-month period where I'm just on it. But I, I know in my process that I'm not efficient enough to just suddenly just write loads because I need to kind of ease my way into any kind of creative process. Um, but I think it's really, really fair comment, and I don't know what the answer is until I really, I suppose, commit to it. What There is a fear of tagging myself as creative, but there's a fear of that period between like 2008 and 2012 where it didn't become, it wasn't enjoyable anymore because it become, I want it, it come like something like I had to do for mm. reasons. I think, you, I think just- it sounds like you just need the balance probably. And I, I think actually lots of people, it would be very healthy for them to have a, a separate outlet to make, to make it f- not fun again, but to, for it to feel like um, not a job. I like I've, I had enough jobs in my life to know that a job can make you feel very differently about anything, and I wouldn't want the fact that being a producer is a job to make me feel differently about something that makes me feel so happy. Mm. Um, and I, it's a fear of losing that. It's better to be constantly striving for something than to be in the moment and then realise well, well, what's next. I think it's that that can be the same with anything. It's like the the actual thought of something can feel more idyllic than when you're actually there and able to touch it. It's like yeah, yeah. it's not oh, quite completely. And I, I mean, that can manifest itself in things that you might be scared of. But something you're when you're in the moment of something that caused fear, it's actually not necessarily as bad as you thought it would be. But equally, if you kind of build something up to be the like, the be all and end all, and you're there. And oh, actually, just like it just feels like another day, or mm. like I don't know. That's that's so. I think that's that is at the back of the mind. And yeah, committing to a creative. I think I, I, I'm definitely getting more comfortable with it. It would define you at that point, wouldn't it? Because you'd be like, yeah. If you if you were full time and you were like, oh, this is just what I do now, it would that would be your definition. Um, can we just have a little insight into like how you deal with? Um, critique and with just like feedback on what you put out into the world I know uh, the other thing actually I want you to touch on if you can is because I, I, you always say what is it you always say about your DJing it's like you always say that you feel like everyone's just waiting for the next person to come on or something um, <laughs> yeah. um, and that, that people are just sort of like and <laughs> sort of humouring you <laughs> yeah well, just, I think this, there is a, I think I don't know that's ch- I, I felt that like with with the DJing thing, is that I felt like, more, like recently, I felt like there's been more audiences that kind of got what I'm about in the sense that I've just stuck to what I've always done and what sounds best to me, which is just like let, giving tunes a few minutes and it just doesn't feel like too long. And uh, and I know I definitely know there's been times where it, in the in the wrong environment people are just like oh, when's the next dj gonna come on and just smash us with some tune i i definitely get i definitely know that that's happened but i equally know that like, over the last couple of years it's like been a swell of people that have kind of understood that and 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 enjoy it and i suppose if my argument would almost be is that if you're playing good enough music it should be should be good to listen to a, a couple of years a couple of minutes of tunes and as for just general critique i mean i, I love critique generally like in all, all walks of life i love like even if it's quite uncomfortable to take at the time and i might get defensive and i might counter it i take it on board and i take it into the like the kind of next time i do something and um like providing it's con- constructive 
like if the, yeah, someone just saying you're shit or something, it's not doesn't do anyone any good. But like if someone get if, if someone's willing to give me some decent critique, then I, I, I gladly accept it. But then equally, I don't send out my music much because it comes back to when I was first sending out music, it would just be like radio silence and I could almost become a bit stubborn and my, my, do you find that difficult? Um, yeah, I find it difficult. And I, so do you, feel, do you feel like you need, like, do you feel like you need people to come back and tell you what they think about it? Or do you need like validation or? Yeah, but I think like, if I'm really, like, if I'm really honest, I think, if, oh, I think only the really, the most headstrong and confident people don't need some degree of validation. I agree. I just like, um, so yeah, and I just keep things in my circle of people that I know all like you. You're you're one of them. There's half a dozen, maybe a dozen people that I send tunes to, and like, and I don't even necessarily need feedback. I just know if you're going to play it or you don't. If you play it, that's you know that's 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 all the feedback I need in that sense. Mm. Um, but you sort of, sort of like, I just got to the point where I decided that I just wait for people to ask me. And then I send it, and I kind of feel like if they've made the effort to ask me, then they're probably going to give it a listen, and like just just kind of I don't know, it's a defence mechanism, I suppose. And it's uh, and because yeah, I just didn't like the didn't like the I couldn't maybe I I could take it better now, but at the time I was too too vulnerable and too stressed and and too bothered by the fact that I hadn't made it and I hadn't become this producer I wanted to be. I just didn't have the mental strength to be able to take the fact that people were just ignoring it. So I just kept it to my circle and I was just really fortunate that some people within that circle got picked up on it. And then, and then you like, and then it gives you like a, and if I, I think if I send music to most people now, they'd probably listen to it to a degree. If... Um, is there anything like, I know that you say that you feel like you have imposter syndrome and as a, as a consequence of that, I do too, by the way. It's very difficult. It's part of being self-doubting and self-deprecating. You suddenly feel like you're going to be caught out or found out at any moment. But do you feel like there's... Are you, are you aware of, like, the qualities that mean that you're a successful person um, or a successful artist um, and the downfalls or the downsides that you need to work on and conversely to that is there anything that you see in other people like qualities that you're envy envious of or like you think shit i wish i was a bit more like that uh yeah i think uh, so to, to, to take that in two parts i think the qualities that i think the main quality that helps me is that i think i've got a reasonable ear for what's good music regardless of me Play, like whether it's by me or by someone else or no, no, that, that's that's I let, i've got confidence in my taste in yeah. the sense that if i like if i like something i think it's good and not everyone's gonna like it but i'm stubborn and i think right this is good music and i used to be like as a like i used to impose music on people as a teenager and say look this is this is great this is like amazing music and sometimes people would get it and not but like i kind of i feel like i know one what is good but then i'm i also know that it's kind of like a self-centered view that what i what i think is good is actually good but i know that's not realistic but i can kind of identify what i like and then i can i i'm willing to put enough time in the studio to hopefully come out with something that kind of sits within that sphere of what i like and then i can pull it out to the world that's a really interesting juxtaposition though from being someone who's not confident and self-deprecating so you must have like quite a high threshold for things to go from being um able to be doubted through to being absolutely utterly confident in something do you see what i mean yeah yeah, yeah they, no, i understand yeah because they kind of sit they do kind of sit side by side in the sense that like I get it too. You doubt something, you doubt something, and then suddenly something happens, uh, either with um, a piece of work you're working on, or you hear some a piece, another piece of music in a different context, then your relationship to it totally changes. And in your case, it sounds like <laughs> you go from thinking, "Oh, it's shit, it needs more work. Oh, it's shit, it needs more work," or and then suddenly it switches over into a. You get to a position where it's like, "I'm actually really confident in this now." And yeah, it's a tip. It's definitely a tipping point. And is that maybe is that the point where you can let go of it for you? Yeah, I think I think once 
I played it out, and actually, to be honest with you, like my kind of relationship with playing out demos and tunes has kind of changed a bit, um, in the sense that I like playing out would be a testing ground for 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 music, and it still is to a degree. But I don't, I'm not like with the Blue Hour. I play out m- more of it now; it's been released than before it was released because I don't know. I felt like people maybe needed to know the tunes whereas something like the view i was hammering for like a good few years before it come out and people were like didn't know how to like i was confident enough in that tune that even though people weren't really dancing they were listening rather than being bored yeah <laughs> uh, um and i didn't quite have enough and maybe i didn't have, didn't have so much confidence with some of the blue some of the blue hour stuff i did but some of it i thought maybe was a bit too too left field or something for that but they have they have to have those challenging ones in there that challenge your conceptions because if you were i think there has to be uh, like with any long player you have to have little weaknesses in there that don't quite meet that standard otherwise it would just all sound very similar or yeah you know and i think that's that's the tension that needs to be there for it to be an accomplished piece of work i think with anything there's i think i think that's another thing actually that i picked up on your stuff i've, I've and I, to be honest i've only really been able to put a label on it by talking to you and listening to it today and yesterday is there is a nice tension in a lot of it well there's certainly the start the tunes of yours that i like the most there's a really nice tension so that for example that blinding one's just like i I admit i must have missed that the first time that album came out but when you told me to check it out a little while ago when we were talking there's a lovely tension in that one between something being really happy and melodic but there being really subtle undertones of aggression and um punchiness and sort of forcefulness to it um, yeah i think that's one of i think that's one of the like i think that's one of the one of the tracks i'm most proud of because of it's just a development and there's mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of how it progresses and how it goes from one thing to a com- to something completely different and i was like of all the things from the album i wish that that maybe got more attention it did and but it was I knew it was tough. It's a nine-minute listen or something, and mm. like eight and a half, and like the people don't have the attention span for that anymore. But I don't really, I don't like like. And there's a lot, and that album is just littered with outros because I love outros. I love just like really taking an idea and expanding it, and and like bringing it to a head. And I felt that if and my rationale was is that if someone had the patience to listen to the first four minutes of the, of the tune they're going to give me the last two minutes anyway and i can kind of go can kind of go where i want and you're almost giving them like a little payoff at the end for having committed yeah, yeah, so yeah, much so time it's their reward for getting there yeah, and yeah. uh and, and and i think the tension and resolution is 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 is, is, is i think it's it's so fundamental to music full stop and that can be like tension through um suspending a chord so you kind of leave it where it feels like it it's just sitting in a place where it shouldn't be like Lydian off that album is a tune that I I was I really enjoyed but that tune sits suspend melodically suspended um for quite some time and then resolves and then I, lo- I love that absolutely love that music now that you're saying it as well I would say I wouldn't say that there's any there's tunes of yours that are really really simple ideas like pot shot for example but then they have complexities in them that make them you because most people would have just rolled that sort of baseline thing out 64 bars breakdown maybe less but you've i feel like you how you you i think it's like a sense of like doing it justice doing the idea justice and not just not just leaning heavily on the simplicity and strength of the simple idea but like almost pushing it to the nth degree where because of that all the qualities that we've discussed you have to you kind of you can't just leave it as that's the drum beat that's the bass line yeah i think that's totally fair i think like and well, it's, it's, it, and i I'd like actually really appreciate you saying that because that's how i feel about the kind of process in that maybe i feel a bit uncomfortable with just keeping things too well how looks too simple because how i how I, like what i'm tr- striving to achieve like beyond this kind of like color and feeling is that uh, what at, at the core root of what is good music um and this is something that that, that you can pick through every genre of music that, that exists to, well to most of them is that the best tunes tend to be simple and and 
they ha- they, they they're just it's just something that people can maybe like i don't know like it people like this like simply they don't like things that are overly complex but so that so what i try and achieve or what i'm what i'm aiming to achieve is this thing that i love about other music is that it's a relatively simple idea but it's just full of complexity yeah. when you actually if you want to let let yourself go with the music there's so much going on around this simple fundamental idea and that is what i try to achieve so i try not to leave like there tends to be a lot of layers in most of my music and if there's not layers there's a lot of like really really subtle automation and a lot of things just shifting and and actually some of that comes from like technical de- deficiencies in the sense that um a static mix down of a tune um to commit to you know your pads are at this level your bass is at that level your drums are here and the samples are at this level it's quite i find it quite difficult to commit to that's the level so what i started doing was almost giving a range that the kind of main pad might sit in and then i just gently drift between those those kind of those levels and i do that with other sounds and then i would interweave interweave them between each other so actually you might hear um hear a tune and it's just you know it's just a bass a pad and an arp and some sa- and some fx but if you actually really listen to it uh, over the next 40 seconds although it's just those sounds and they just they're, they're just they're doing their thing like that the arps might be slightly louder here than they were there and the pads have ducked down and or the fx has got louder so things if you really want to get involved you hear things at, at, at different levels and they're moving around and i think that that kind of subtle movement can make what what what, what is otherwise quite a static tune quite interesting mm. and and the majority of people if you listen you're not going to hear that in a club for instance you probably it's for headphones and stuff and that comes down to the fact that i consume most of my music tra- like commuting or traveling in my headphones where i can get totally lost in it and i love the fact that there's like subtle nuances and that's what i want to try and achieve i think that's really that's quite interesting because i think like your it seems like the way that you deal with the insecurities about what you're doing is to work and work and work and work and work and add detail and more detail and more detail which is absolutely commendable and i think like adds to all the richness and i'm the total opposite in the sense that i'll almost let go of a tune too soon so that i can be like oh well it's only a demo you know like it's only yeah 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 do you know what i mean i'm the, i'm kind of like oh well you know i just bounced that out it's kind of done but i'm also i'm also a fan of when things do seem a bit basic as well i like the extremes of that of that um spectrum so i love stuff that where you go back and there's loads of detail and like you've got your outro you've got your long intro and all that stuff i've I really that can add the 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 warmth in the relationship between me and the piece where you've really you've kept the idea exactly as it was but you've just added a richness and a detail to the intro the outro the edits and all that stuff i love that but i also have a, a quite an interesting tension with um letting go of music that's fucking super basic and not going to town on all of the the ed- edits and stuff well i think over the years our, our arrangements have have like pulled apart in the sense that they were probably more similar 10 years ago than they are now in the fact that you 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 very much get to the gets to the crux of the tune quickly and you get in you get involved and it's you've got 32 bars you've got your breakdown you've got your drop and like it's, it's like there's that's, that's, but that speaks to what I was just saying, which is which is like getting to the crux of it. Quite is like hiding behind in plain sight, almost in terms of yeah. Like, but that makes for enjoyable tunes, and it makes the tunes that work in the context which they're that they're, they're meant to work. And it's it's whereas I've always just I, maybe I'm just being deliberately contrary, or I'm I'm like. Oh. But you've just sort of nailed it in the sense of talking about the context in which it's consumed, because I think you some of your tunes w- would work better in the context of being listened to on headphones rather than in a club and there's some that work in both and i think if you can i think i think that's the that's what you're trying to resolve it seems to me it looks like you're trying to resolve where you've got something that's listenable on spotify at 10 a.m in the morning on a commute but also can work in a club yeah i suppose that, that's that that is that is a consideration in the fact that i don't i want 
my music to work in a club. I want it to. It's not always easy. And I kind of feel like I managed to find a sweet spot with certain tunes where they achieve like the uh, that kind of sense that I can play them in a club and people will get it. But I also feel like that was kind of a, it, it comes back to hard work. That was almost like a like the hard work of developing an audience, I suppose, being super, super stubborn about my DJ sets, being super stubborn about the music that I play to the point where you, I've, gathered thankfully like enough people that will give me a chance and 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 know that that's what i'm going to do so then it gives you the scope to be able to do it and not feel so self-conscious about it i just feel like you know you've got a like you just just got to be true to you yeah 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 and i've got so far into it like what's the point and like i I think i think that 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 it's almost like it becomes like a usp in the sense that i mean there are obviously others that do it but um but it's it's not me and it's never has been me so like why why pretend it just something just occurred to me as well like uh, and I, I guess this might be a recurring theme because obviously these discussions are going to be they're, they're supposed to be like a journey i'm not i'm not an interviewer by any stretch of the imagination i guess i'm having to act a little bit on that front but um they're, they're always going to be certain amount there's always going to be a certain amount of me comparing my process to you to the person i'm talking to's process um and, try, and 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 i guess that's just gonna be a natural part of it and i'm gonna just have to be happy with that i'm not an interviewer this is literally just an exploration of a theme um but does that um because I, I mean it's, it's easier for me to identify this and then ask you the question so i would identify myself as someone who's impatient impulsive i <clears throat> rush um so i guess could you say given what you've just said about how you like your music to be and how you like it to pan out and you like long arrangements would you say that you're more patient um probably more patient than you yeah i wouldn't (laughs) i'm certainly more patient than my wife but i mean i'm 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 not i wouldn't consider myself i suppose i am patient i'm definitely can be impulsive mm. and i think um in some ways music is kind of like like the fact that i the creative process is is how it is is because it's almost like to, as a as a counterbalance to perhaps more how i am in my everyday life rather than a manifestation of of, of how i am i mean I'll, i've i've worked in the studio with you jack and we've, we've we have some similarities in our approach and our creative approach and like I think I spoke to you before about when, when you, you say about um, you as someone, and I'm, I'm not going to start interviewing you, but someone you that, can. I think that would be interesting. Yeah, yeah like so you like you know, when you asked me about critique mm-hmm. and um, how you react to it and validation, you, like my experience with you, Jack, and, and I love you for it, is is that you l- look for validation when you're asking for critique sometimes and that's part of your process <laughs> yeah and it's like like jack you've asked me a question i was like what i think i know what you want the answer to be um and i but i know and at the same time so you, you and i know actually being in the studio i've gone yeah jack how about this and you're like no 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 this works and you've got like a confidence in the conviction and it maybe that's your impulsion and maybe that's like some of these characteristics that you've you portrayed there but you you're like very very like almost tunnel visioned on an idea and an execution and I, i'm definitely not like that i think i think when i'm when i'm sending stuff for people i think when i send stuff to people and it's and there's a question it's there's often um again this is like a mirroring of the darren conversation but there's like you hang yourself up on mix stuff uh, for fear of completing it but also it's it's being i'm become I'm not saying I'm like by any stretch um, like good at this, but better at self-reflection. So when I find myself feeling confident about something, I like to just test that confidence. Basically, it's like you give it to someone whose critique you respect, and say like, and you're actually like, is this shit or is this all right? You know, and it, yeah, and, yeah. It, and it is a, an element of um, ne- it's not just validation. It's just like it's just. Um, I'm quite. I can be quite impressionable as well as confident, which sounds weird because. No, I get that. You know, I, get, I feel. I feel the same. I'm definitely. I can. I can definitely be convinced of something, even though I thought 
I was convinced that I felt completely the other, the opposite way five minutes ago. If someone's got, someone can convince me in a, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a manner that's, that something I once thought was wrong, I, I, I'm not so headstrong and stubborn that I would not be willing to change my opinion. And that can, that could be on music as well. And I think, no, so I think with, with you, when you send out music is that you, you're, Particularly, I'm not, I'm not one particularly to give you engineering advice because you're a much better engineer than I am. And sometimes I know when you sent me and you've asked me a question, um, you already know the answer. <laughs> and I think I pointed out to you before, and you yeah, and I'm like, you know what the answer is to this, Jack, or you know what I'm going to say. And I said, like, well, no, let's no, fine. And I was like, if that's what you need for your own validation, that's fantastic. Like, I'd, like that's what I'm there for as a friend and a, as a, like a collaborator or or whatever. Um, and I suppose I do that. Like sometimes I will like. I think we all do it. Sometimes I'll send something to someone, and sometimes I have a genuine question. You know, like feels like the sub bass is too light here or feels you know like a technical question or feels like this is wrong or that's wrong but see of course sometimes i send it to one of my trusted persons and i i'm i'm after a certain answer and i'm disappointed if i don't get it because not because i'm disappointed in them because i'm because i know that perhaps i've i'm i'm wrong and then sometimes I'll be like, no, no, they're wrong. I'm right here. And then you just kind of almost, I don't know. That's a tension in itself. It's like, so what you've just explained there is exactly how I feel about it. It's like sometimes you send stuff out and you're so confident that you know it's good that it doesn't matter what the feedback is. Sometimes you send it kind of knowing something's not right with it and you're you're open eared to hear the response to get some ideas about how to finish it and sometimes you have a false confidence that it doesn't really matter what they say you're going to believe um i mean you no sorry sometimes you say you send it wanting a specific response like you said so there's like different iterations of it and that that is all part of the sort of psyche of a creative, isn't it? It's like there's certain tunes I've made where I've no, where I've known I'm like that's just done, and I'm confident in that one. I just know. Um, yeah, and it, that's a great feeling when it happens. Mm. Uh, I think also what as part of the process, it will depend what part of the process you are. For instance, when you ask that question, or and I ask that question, because what might happen with me is I might be, you know poodling around in the studio and then i get a sample i get a, i find something on the keys and i'm like i think that's good i think that's good and i load it up and i put some drums on it put a bass on it and i'm like fuck this is amazing this is like this tune is going to change the world what have i done what have i done here and i'll stand up and i'll pace around my studio i'll go outside i'll go and make a tea go, i'll be like fuck i'd be buzzing and that that like it's almost like that feeling is one of the most addictive things about being in the studio because it's not something that i've genuinely been able to recreate elsewhere in life mm. and if at that moment i asked you a question what do you think of this and you told me something different i would just not believe you yeah but then but then but then like an hour later of trying to develop it into like a tune 64 bars and come back the next day or come back after some lunch you know this is what this what was i what was i thinking like a bass is out of key like what like you know like <laughs> do you, like the, the euphoria of it and it's part of the process and like i don't know like and see how you might expect someone to respond to a tune is going to be different as to where you are in that process and i like i won't lie there have been times where i've like really felt that when i've got something going and i like that feeling of excitement that you get and like pacing around, I can't, I basically can't do anything because I'm so like, I'm really, really buzzing. I'm really excited. This could be great. Right. I don't, as someone who spends a lot of time in the studio, I don't have a huge output. So I have these kind of moments and they're important to me. Um, and that doesn't necessarily, like, some of them tunes might not be finished, but that kind of, when you're in that, in that kind of real like zone, I think, if anyone told me anything bad about that tune, it's you're either going to be like, "Oh come on, mate, why are you being such a killjoy?" Or you know, <laughs> like, even if they're totally being like honest and stuff. And so I think that sometimes you're and you ping a lot of music back and forth, and sometimes you might ask a question when you're in that kind of bubble of a tune where and there's there's a couple of bubbles that happen with a tune. There's a bubble that happens with a tune where you're utterly convinced it's 
amazing. Equally, you can get on the other side of it, but you can get in a kind of get in a rut with a tune, or you can get to, you lose perspective of it, and you can think it's shit, and then mm. you need you need someone else to be like, is this is this if I what have I done here, and mm. or you sometimes need fresh ears, and like and I suppose that those kind of feelings about the process and about tunes are one of the reasons why things take me quite a while and I digest something because I, I sometimes you want to be it, sure uh, you want to be sure about yeah you it. want to be sure and you mm. and you can't be and you can't be and you need to be able to like clear your head of like the emotional reaction to something that you've created because you've created it and, and 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 become objective and listen to it how you'd listen to it if it was done by someone else a bit you become it's, it's about becoming a little bit more detached isn't it and then being able to objectively look back at it without the emotional and without the without uh without the like with the, with the magic again if that makes sense so you've forgotten how you did everything um but it's also, I think, I think I talked about this a little bit before with Darren's um, this idea of flow state and like when everything's happening and everything's flowing and um, you know time is no object and things are just moving and you're in that state where everything you do seems to be right. As soon as you start to bring ego is the wrong word, but any critique in is this shit or is this um, this is amazing it starts to affect your um, ability to just do the work, you know, just to actually just... Because you start either thinking it's the dog's bollocks, which isn't a good thing, and or crippling self-doubt, and, you know, you convince yourself it's not very good. Yeah, I think, like, a, a balanced like balance approach or a view on anything you're working on is really, really important, because if you're going to be too high or low on it, I don't know, you're not going to be in a position to make good judgment calls and i think a lot of the tunes that sit there as kind of ideas i messed up because i got too high or i got too low and usually because <laughs> i got too got yeah. too like i think quite a lot of ideas but like as it's something that develops with experience i've just i wasted a lot of time just kind of rather than finishing an idea to something that was playable if imperfect i would get 80 percent of the way de- there and just restart again because that wasn't right and then i'd my ears would get tired and i'd overwork it and then i'd just ruin it and mm. so like i think the ability to be able to have an objective view at all times is really really useful and it's something nice. that no pro even pros don't have it so you know. no I, I don't know like it's just i think like like if i was to sum up my being a producer over the last like, 15 years or whatever is that wasted well i spent a lot of time with no output but what i've been doing is learning what not to do next time and like you just then you start to na- nail down and also understand that if something works with the, and it sits outside the sphere of what might be right that it still can be right yeah i think that's that's a nice um, lesson to live your musical life by as long as you think it's right no don't let anyone tell you it's wrong it has to because it's all about because music can be reduced to like science and you know like frequencies gelling together and all that shit but actually it doesn't get inside the essence of it at all it just it's trying to break it down into hard you're trying to basically understand chaos through you know some facts and figures I don't know. yeah absolutely um okay I've got one question one last question for you all right, sweet. Um, and I think this was the last question I asked Dee, and I might just make this a little thing at the end of every um, podcast, is um, what does success look like to you? Uh, oh, yeah, um, I remember that question. I can't remember Darren's answer. Um, what does success look like? Um, a, a su- success is a tune that I feel like reflects my mood and my emotions and it's it's not kind of it's not linked to like sales or popularity success is just something that comes out and i'm I'm proud of in terms of like on a on a on a kind of more macro view like despite everything that i've said so far success would be making music and it being absolutely the music I want to make without any kind of external influence and it and it's supporting me, my wife and my, my, my two daughters. Like that that would be like the kind of macro view of success. Mm-hmm. What 
I identified when I'd kind of put the album out with Marcus on Solar, there was a few options without going into too many details. And there were a few options that were careers, you know, they were give up your job. This is full time. And it's, it was, it was what I thought I wanted until I sat down and thought about the essence about what, why I make music. And I, I have a job, I've had jobs. I didn't want music to ever feel like a job in the sense that someone would have the ability to dictate what I could and couldn't do. And that would be not only that would be creatively in terms of my output, like what gigs I took, what decisions I made on remixes, what I, what, what I did with my life. I felt like I so kind auto- of got basically to, autonomy. Yeah. Autonomy. And I think like, I think, I got to a stage in my life. If I'd been if I, the, the album deals I got offered, if I'd have been 22, 25 or something like that, I would have probably slapped them up because it was all, at that stage, just all I wanted to be. And I'd have been willing to take the sacrifices of autonomy that come with them because they would have guaranteed me careers. No doubt. As long as I could put some kind of output on what they wouldn't have guaranteed me was control of that output and some kind of, kind of leaning and that's not to say that these were deals are like you've just got to go and write tunes like this or whatever, but there was definitely like an expectation that come with them and the meetings were focused on what I could change about my music rather than, well, I suppose it was what was good, but what where they see me going and it didn't necessarily reflect what I wanted from it. So, and so I was a bit older and I'd done that and I was like, I just needed the purity. I'd done, I've done work, I've done jobs, I've done... I've, I've done that answering to bosses and I wanted to keep music as the thing that was the most exciting and the most, one of the most enjoyable facets of my life. I wanted to keep that pure and I wanted to keep that away from those influences. So success to me would is maintaining that. And I think if I take some perspective, really I've, I've become a a lot more successful than I ever thought I would be. And I caveat that in the kind of relativity of drum and bass and then the niche within drum and bass that I sit. Like I know it, I know it's not, I know it's niche music and it's a niche part of like culture. Um, and, but it's still more than I ever could have hoped. Like when I first sat on a sequencer, you know, like I like say the first goal was to get a vinyl out and then you get one, it's to get the next and, you know, like these, every every goal that I had was linear and just kind of stepped up and that was super exciting to me. And, and even now I sometimes lose sight of it where I've got a gig and I can't be asked. And I have to like look at myself and think like, well, you know, like think about what you would have, like 15 years ago, yeah. like Lucy tells me, Lucy's, like I say, Lucy's like, she's, Lucy's so supportive in that kind of creative process and always been really supportive because she has to sacrifice as much as I do. And you'll probably know that with your relationships, Jack, and stuff mm. that the the, kind of, the the spouse they take a bit of the flack, like they they lose some of your time. They lo- like they, you know, she 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 lost me for a bit because I'd be in the studio and stuff. She, I mean, she does get the benefit of she do she does like to go out and have fun, so she gets she and she she does enjoy that. But you know, like so, but she's quite good sometimes when I'm like, oh, you know. You know, I've got to go and play this festival. And and she's like, imagine if I'd have told you 15 years ago, you'd be playing on the festival with these people. You would have been, like, bouncing off the walls. And, yeah, and I think, and, and I'm like, yeah, I would be. And sometimes you just get a bit lost in the grind of it. And maybe because I am a bit tired because I've worked and got kids and that. Mm. So if I take, like, if I look at it, like, just take a step back, like, like success looks like what, what I have, you know, it's you know, like I think of myself as a, a, well overachieving. I sit right now in my garden in a studio um, that's mine. But I don't get enough to spend enough time in, but that's another story. <laughs> um, but like, like, like that's 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 success, you know. Like I can't I can't really ask for anything more, and I just hope that I can sustain it for you know a little bit longer, um, and that, that one day it might be able to like be the thing i do um i guess i guess i guess um 
Because there's, uh, it's a kind of open-ended question in the sense that you can look at the tangible and money aspects of success, but you can also look at like how rewarding, um, whether 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 the se- success is found externally through like you being revered, or whether it's internal, or whether it's a mixture of both, and whether it's, um, you know, it's, it could because it can be material or it can be um a spiritual is the wrong word because i fucking hate kind of that shit but yeah like, no, but i know mean? i know what you mean it's like something for the soul and like so i think i think at the moment success as measured as something material like i'm like, i feel like i'm overachieving i mean my mum doesn't quite understand why i haven't just wrote a christmas song and like <laughs> just just like just just rinsed it out for a little while um but like like that as a relative in terms of the fact that i've kept purity and uh, i've just kind of wrote the music that i want i've had more the kind of material success than i ever thought i would in terms of like success as in satisfying this burning desire to create something i still think that i still don't think i've like achieved that in a sense like and maybe that's because and i hope it hope this is the case like maybe that, that you can never fully satisfy that kind of creative desire that burns, you know, like the pilot light that sits within you because the moment that is satisfied, it just like, what, what would be the, what would be the point, I suppose. So I suppose success in that kind of micro level is like maintaining that desire to still want to do it, to still want to try something new. I still feel like I haven't delivered anything that is exactly like a project that is exactly what i wanted to do or what i aim for and i and although i'm very proud of what i've released i couldn't actually tell you the thing that i want to achieve but like this it's something i'm still reaching for like a like a feeling like some kind of like mood or setting and like a longing for something that's there that i can kind of feel like i can touch from creativity but never can quite reach and I, I think I think the aim is that that always sits out of reach and I'm always striving for that and that is why I come in to the studio and yeah play a, play a D minor seventh and think I've changed the world <laughs> brilliant I love that I think that's a good nice way to end um, oh, wicked that's a lot of you, fun Jack if you could go and just play some D minor sevenths and then yeah I will do on a Juno that's it yeah, like that's right, I think yeah. I think that's I think that's what I think that's all I all I want from life. <laughs>